So I want to start by saying thank you. Um, thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to my colleagues from Okwanda, from the faculty, the university, other institutions. Particularly, I must say thank you to Susan van Skalkbeck, who has come straight from the airport. Uh, we should just land her from Switzerland, where we put together at a conference last week to stay. So thank you, Susan. Um, it's really good to have so many people and, and so many people who weren't named in the various uh, uh, welcomes that were given. And for risk of repetition, I want to also say thank you again to, to my family. Uh, you can see us at one of our favourite places, Pilansburg Game Reserve, which we had to unfortunately leave behind in moving to Cape Town. Um, but it's really special to have my sons, Tim and Michael, with us, my future daughter-in-law, Karen. And as you heard, Peter was not able to be with us because it camp, but he heard the, the talk last night and gave me some very uh, constructive <laughs> feedback. Um, and nothing of this would have happened without Jackie. I uh, appreciate her support being here more than uh, I can say in a few words uh, tonight. So my journey, I think, has been a real privilege. I'm privileged both because of the opportunity I have now in terms of being at Aquanda and taking on the role of director of Aquanda, but also because of the opportunities that have come my way in the past. And it's often taken me by surprise. I think there was never a road that I had mapped out when I started my rural journey, and even the rural journey was something of a, of a surprise. But I've always had a sense of calling, a sense of affirmation that as I have moved forward that this is the way of walking it. I'm grateful for where I am now, but it is only because of what has been in the past, of the people who have been there, the people I've worked with, the people I've learned from, the people I've been privileged to meet along the way. Probably the most significant part of the journey in many ways in terms of understanding rural was the nine years I spent at Manguzi Hospital uh, in northern KwaZulu Natal on the border of Mozambique as a medical officer, conscientious objector, medical superintendent and many others. It's very easy to look back on those years and romanticize them because they were years of huge learning and growth. My two older sons were born there, Jackie and I were able to work together, I had many great colleagues, some of whom are here. I did my family medicine masters, we formed Rudasa and so on and so on. And some of that romance perhaps is reflected in a piece uh, I wrote, an excerpt from that Ode to Manguzi. Your beauty seduced me from afar. I came unknowing what sort of lover you'd be. The days and nights of agony ecstasy. Such demands you made, yet so patient, forbearing rages, forgiving mistakes, forging something new, yet old, the less turbulent relationship of long-time lovers, knowing each other's weaknesses, comfortable but not short of surprises. Yet there were two Manguzis, a place of beauty and wonder, but also a place of hardship and suffering. And in some ways also reflected in my life. In the midst of great progress and much excitement, work was demanding and all-consuming, and I flirted with burnout. Thus one might consider this an image of two rurals, and I will return to that notion. We moved to Harder Beersburg for family reasons when I took up a position in the northwest province, and that was a different rural, harsher in many ways and more challenging too, yet also at one remove from me because I was not in the community in the same way as I'd been at Manguzi. I worked first at Medunsa and then, in another surprise in my journey, um, I was appointed the first chair of rural health in Africa when Vitz established a position in partnership with Northwest Province. Uh, and Dr. Max Price was incredibly persuasive. Um, and I don't regret being persuaded by him to take up that position. I certainly never expected that I would be back at my alma mater. I also didn't expect that I would end up at Stellenbosch. Even though I'd been a curtain porter in the early days of Aquanda, it had been part of some of the workshops that led to the development of the rural clinical school. But I'm very happy to be here and I really do work with a great team of people. Sorry, I'm just moving this out of the way. An important part of my journey 
has also been my international colleagues. Working together with like-minded people from around the world has been a huge encouragement and many of them have become good friends. It has been an amazing experience to attend every single World Rural Health Conference since a group of us, including Steve, uh, went to the first one in 1996, supported by Kazuna Natal. I think we were the last doctors to be supported to a conference by Kazuna Natal province. <laughs> anyway, I subsequently became part of the working party in rural practice. I'm very tempted to show you photographs of each of these because that would be fun and would use up my time. Um, but I'll only show you one from 2008, which has been shown at every single conference since then because when it, it was when the leadership of the Working Party was invested as chiefs by the community of Okyong outside Calabar and Cross River State, Nigeria. It's an honor we still I hold in, in great esteem. So why place in the sun? As I set out in my monograph, which you will receive afterwards, my thesis is that rural areas have been left behind in the developments that have occurred since 1994, yet they are equally deserving of their place in the sun. In this presentation, I've taken key issues from my paper and I'm reflecting on them through stories. I'm not going to expound on all the theory from the paper, please read it afterwards. Um, and I won't detail all the references that are here, there, except perhaps some that are not cited in the paper. And I'm not going to bore you with details of my papers, which again are referenced in that. For this image, I want to pay, pay a special tribute to a very good colleague from uh, WITS, Nonsikalera Mapukata, who worked together for many years, who really gave me this image of the fireplace as a place where rural people sit around and tell stories which mean so much. But let's first address the issue of definitions. Michael Woods in his book Rural, which is a text of rural geography, states the following. The varied functions and meanings that have, attributed to, that have been attributed to rural space have made the rural into an ambiguous and complex concept. The rural is a messy and slippery idea that eludes easy definition and demarcation. We could probably all instinctively say whether any given place was rural to us rather than urban, but explain why it was rural, not urban, and drawing a boundary line between urban and rural on a map are altogether more difficult tasks. I wonder, what are the images that come to your mind when I say the word rural? What are the pictures that start forming in your mind? There may be pictures like this, which come from the Manguzi area, most of them. Uh, are those the kind of images that you have in mind? Or perhaps you have the iconic image of rural South Africa in the literature, which comes from Alex Payton's Cry of the Beloved Country, and those opening lines as they were presented in the movie. There is a lovely room that runs from the Congo into the hills. These hills of grass covered and rolling, and they are lovely beyond any city of it. The road climbs seven miles into them to Kerasbrook, and from there, if there is no mist, you look down on one of the fairest valleys in Africa. But actually, the book is a story of contrasts, including the contrast of the beauty of the rural but the harsh realities of rural life. And this is well described in the following excerpt. As the sun breaks over the furthest hill, rim of hills at Bizana, it illuminates the world apart, an idol in the city dwellers' mind of quietude, of blowing cattle, smoke rising in the still morning air, vivid bird calls in the waking bush, a river gleaming and silent. But being there is different. Being there is not romantic. To be there is to be engaged in a struggle to live and to hope. So let me tell you about a patient of mine from Manguzi. E.T., as his nickname was, was a 76-year-old Induna, a retired school teacher who was part of the local tribal council. He had this wonderful mango tree in his garden, so mangoes always remind me of him. I saw him regularly as a patient at Manguzi. He had hypertension and diabetes, amongst a number of other things. 
Steadily over the years, his kidneys were starting to fail and reached the point where he was an established chronic renal failure. I sat down with him and presented to him the options, which were not very many. There was no way we could do dialysis at Mambuzi, and he was too old uh, for the transplant pro program. So Durban was the closest place three hours away where he could go for dialysis. He had relatives in Durban. I suggested to him that he go to Durban and, and spend the remainder of his life there, could come back to Mambuzi on weekends um, in order to get the dialysis. He thought about it very seriously and then said to me, no. That's not life for me. I don't want that. I want to stay here with my family, my community, with the people I know, with the home I love, with the environment that is mine. I don't mind living shorter if that's what I can experience. For him, rural was about much more than just the place. I looked after him for a number of years until I left. He died about eight years um, after that, quite peacefully um, at home. So I reflect on that, and I want to touch on four issues, the latter, which three of which I will go into more detail. First, two relationships are central. Not only our relationship, doctor patient, but the broader relationship of ET with the community and his family. Then I want to talk about rurality as not just being geography, the notion of place, the two rurals that I've alluded to, I'll come back to, and access is the rural health issue. So let's think about the notion of place. 35% of South Africans are rural, according to World Bank data. Rural, though, is not the negative of urban. Rural is not non-urban. Place is important for all of us, but place is particularly important for rural people. And we need a theory of place in order to understand reality. Any epistemology of rural must connect geographical and existential realities. If you prefer, we need to think about being rural as inseparable from rural, or as the geographers call it, the rural. Jiren has proposed three components of place. A geographic location, which is your GPS coordinates. It is where you are on the map on the globe of the world. It's also material form. That is the environment, the topography, the terrain, the surroundings that you experience when you are rural. But there's a third component of place as well, and that is the investment with meaning and value. The place is also about people, it's also about connections, it's about history and traditions. Inge has referred to places as storied spaces that carry a story with them over time, and that is important in terms of understanding rurality as place. Coexistent with the beauty, as I've alluded to, the harsh reality is that rural areas have been left behind and are being left behind in South Africa. Nelson Mandela said that the most profound challenges in South Africa's development and democracy can be found in its rural hinterlands. These areas systematically and intentionally deprived of the most basic resources under apartheid continue to lag behind the rest of the country in the post-apartheid era. And 13 years later, that has not changed. Spatial analyses of multiple deprivation and poverty have demonstrated the striking overlap between markers of inequity and rural former homeland areas. This map in 2001 shows multiple deprivation indices mapped against rural former homelands. If the same map was done of 2011, uh, Noble and Wright say that we'd come up with very similar results. From 2011, looking at the Youth Multidimensional Poverty Index with former homeland boundaries, we get the same kind of picture. I could show you many more examples and many comparisons of health indices between rural and urban areas which show the effects of deprivation. Thus, despite their place in the struggle for democratic South Africa, rural areas have not been accorded place in the sun. Their struggle for liberation must continue. And commitment to equity demands that we give attention to such issues. Commitment to inequity includes ensuring access to services, including health care. And if I talk about access, I have to quote the person who spelled this out most clearly, but particularly because 
He sadly passed away two months ago. Julian Tudor Hart, who was a Welsh GP for many years, a researcher and a public health physician. I was privileged to hear him speak at the conference in San Diego de Compostela in 2003. Coined in 1971 the term, the inverse care law, what we now call Hart's inverse care law. The availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for it in the population served. And internationally, that is the issue that is common across rural practitioners all over the world. It's the challenge of access to care described by the inverse care law. And once again, equity demands that we address this. Lengiwe was a seven-year-old severely disabled child with cerebral palsy living in the community of Muzi, north of Mozambique, right on the border. She was brought to the hospital by her mother because of severe spasms and she was prescribed medication at Manguzi by one of the doctors who told the mother to bring her back every month to get the treatment. The mother duly did that. This required her to walk for two days, carrying Shingiwe on her back, sleeping overnight in the felt on the way to the hospital, getting the medication and then walking two days back home. Jackie brought her to my attention saying, surely we can do something differently here. Why does she have to walk for two days? Yes, this has to be prescribed by a doctor, but aren't there ways around it? And so we arranged for the medication to be sent signed by a doctor, signed out, and sent with the mobile clinic that was just a few hundred meters away from a home that went once a month to the area. It required us to think differently about the system and to listen to somebody's story in order to address it. Yes, there was much more that needed to be done for Sengiwe uh, than that, but it was one small thing we could do. Reflecting on that, once again, relationships are central. But I want to look at the issue of access in terms of systems and human resources and relate that to the national health insurance. And then talk about how do we train change agents to avoid the kind of issue that arose with Lingiwe. Rural people like all of us desperately need universal health coverage. The cost of free health care is crippling in some rural families. Because of transport, poor rural households in Pumalanga spend up to 60% of their monthly income on health care because of travel. In a national survey, about 15% of rural households accessing health care face financially catastrophic costs. Will NHI address this? Will it deal with transport for rural people? Will NHI deliver on universal health coverage? For me, the fundamental access flaw that how does changing the source of funding lead to more and better healthcare workers for the poor, especially in rural areas? What makes a person most likely not to have access? It's been poor, it's been marginalized, it's been rural, it's been disabled. We need a clear strategy to provide equitable access to healthcare for poor, marginalized, rural, disabled people if we are to have universal health coverage. But this is not about standing on the outside throwing stones. This is saying we need to get involved to make sure that we have the kind of universal health coverage that we need in South Africa. We need to be part of that change. How do we become part of that change? I was invited to a meeting at a new hospital in the Northwest. It's not the one in the, in the picture, uh, which I'm keeping anonymous, but a similar hospital. After the meeting, I was asked if I wanted a tour of the new hospital, so it would be great. We went round and it was nice to see. And the thing that stands in my mind was seeing their beautiful rehabilitation unit. It was lovely, pristine, beautiful blue floor. I couldn't see not a footstep on the floor. Lots of equipment all around. And in the far corner of the room was a desk behind which there were two young professionals sitting. I went to go and talk to them. They were community service therapists, one physiotherapist, one occupational therapist. I said, you know, what have, have you seen patients? What is happening? 
Well, it's very slow. The doctors don't refer very often. So I talked a bit to them about how they might actually encourage doctors in terms of referral. But then I also asked them about this large community that was just outside the gates of the hospital in desperate need. And they said, well, you know, no, they didn't know about that and how they could work there and how they got transport and, you know, and the manager wasn't clear, etc. I was angry, but I wasn't angry with them. I was angry with their institutions, academic institutions, that had sent them out without the tools to do the work they needed to do in that system in order to make a difference. How do we educate health professionals for change? Context, I think, is critical in this. It's addressed in the literature in two ways. Critical pedagogy arising from Paulo Freire talks about imbalances of power in education and seeks to address the fact that ways of seeing become internalized, that those being educated no longer aspire to question or to change the way they are living. How do we get people to question? How do we get people to think critically in terms of the way things are currently functioning? Place-based education refers to a range of educational approaches concerned with context, recognize the value of learning from and in specific places and communities. McLaren and Giro have argued that a critical pedagogy must be a pedagogy of place because the power imbalances and the assumptions of the classroom reflect exactly those that are in the society in which the education occurs. And the learners come with their experiences and histories from their context, and that forms their understanding. And we need to be challenging that. And thus, Grunewald has proposed a critical pedagogy of place, which focuses on learning more socially just and sort of ecologically sustainable ways of being in the world, and challenges educational practices that disregard place. Reed has proposed a critical pedagogy of place as the basis for a distinct rural pedagogy. And I believe that's determined by how we relate to context. Bates and Ellaway defined three ways of thinking about context in a recent uh, scope and review of the literature. Firstly, context as coincidence, which suggests that it doesn't matter where we are. Context is immaterial. It's equivalent. Whatever, wherever you are doesn't matter. And perhaps in terms of learning specific technical skills, that is true. There's also the second one is context is mechanism, which is where we get into transformative learning, where the context is used in terms of student learning, used to change how students learn, because the context uh, is different and challenges the way they think. The third one is context as outcome, which is about accountability. It's about engagement with communities. It's about a reciprocal relationship, service learning in its truest form, where students are not only being transformed through learning in communities, but they're also transforming communities and systems through their learning. I want to take the notion then of social accountability and take it to a different level and to think about the issue of systems. So, the RDP National Upgrading, Clinic Upgrading and Building Program in the 90s uh, was set up to build clinics to provide access to communities all over the country, and certainly in Northern Pacific Natal, uh, that was part of it as well. We had quite a number of clinics that were being built. There was one small problem with the program. It was purely an infrastructure program. Human resources were not considered. There was no human resources plan, no plan for human resources development. You got the clinic. How you started? Well, that wasn't their problem. We had two communities right near each other, Kwasibi and Velabusha. We believed that one clinic could serve both of them equally, but these communities wouldn't agree. Lots of discussions, lots of agreements, lots of fights, sometimes literally fights. Uh, there was never agreement until the clinic upgrading building program the wisdom said, oh, we'll give them each a clinic. That will solve the problem and build a clinic for each of them. Now we needed two times staff instead of one time staff. At Kwasibi, a newly qualified registered nurse midwife was put there with no experience. <coughs> one night, a prime of in labor 
got into difficulty, she didn't recognize the problems early enough, she referred late, the ambulance was slow, etc., leading to a stillbirth. The family decided to sue the clinic, the nurse, and the hospital. I actually really hoped that that would lead to a court case, because I wanted my chance to stand up in court and say, yes, a mistake was made, but actually the system failed. It was the system that was wrong to put an insufficiently trained, insufficiently supported person into that community in that way. The postscript to the story is that the community said, we fought so long for a clinic, don't do anything to disturb it, and they pressurised the family to withdraw the case. You, I'll leave you to decide whether that's a good or bad outcome, but uh, that's what happened. So now I want to look, uh, was, uh, yeah, just reflecting on that again, uh, relationships once again between people, between communities, uh, the family and the community, etc., are central. But I want to reflect a little bit on re human resources development and rule proofing in terms of accountability. So I like to think of human resources development as a pipeline uh, that we need to start with choosing the right students into training. We need to ensure that we're doing undergraduate training in the right context, which is what I've been talking about. We need to ensure that we're providing the right opportunities for people to get postgraduate training. And we need to make sure that healthcare workers are supported in the right environment, both with clinical support, but also managerial and leadership uh, support. And to be accountable, we need to be involved in all of those. I spell out some of the motivations for this uh, in my paper. But also we need to look at systems. And one way of looking at systems is the notion of rural proofing to ensure that policies are accountable to rural communities. The Rural Advocacy Project has drawn up these guidelines for rural proofing based on international experience, and particularly the work done at the Institute for Rural Health uh, in Wales that led to the UK adopting legislation around rural proofing. I prefer to think of it as using a rural lens and actually propose that we have rural impact assessments in just the same way as we have environmental impact assessments. Every policy, every set of regulations should be rural proofed by having a rural impact assessment done. Just as there are regulations for environmental impact assessments, there should be regulations for rural impact assessments so that we can make sure that the impact of these are measured. And that situations like Building clinic infrastructure without thinking like hu about human resources are avoided. I want to say a little bit more about relationships. So, at Manguzi they were developing a water scheme. There was no piped water, various ways of getting water, and I got involved in some of the meetings and work around developing a water scheme for the community. That's the background. I was also, as well as being the community doctor, was also running the paediatric ward, and I'd managed to get some funding to bring, to bring Professor Lucy Wagstaff to visit us three times during the year. Lucy Wagstaff was a doyen of community paediatrics, author of a number of books. I'm sure anyone in the medical world uh, will know her name. So one of her week-long visits, I took her out to the clinic, but there was also a water meeting that day. And I asked if she wouldn't mind if I just popped in briefly to the water meeting on the way to the clinic, to which she agreed. So and she stood or sat in the back of the tribal hall while I attended the meeting for about an hour, then I excused myself and I went on. I apologized to her and I said, sorry for wasting your time sitting in this meeting. And she said, don't say that. That hour you spent is probably the most important hour of your month. What we do, the broader issues, so much more important than just uh, the treatment of disease or whatever we uh, want to do. And it's part of what uh, influenced the way I work um, ever after. Once again, relationships, central relationships with the community, working then with the relationship that I was able to have with a senior mentor, uh, which was such a privilege. But also to say, we've talked about rules, but rules without relationships achieve nothing. Rural areas 
have graveyards of projects of people who've come in there with fine ideas to make change, to develop the people, etc., but do it without ever understanding the people, without ever talking, without ever engaging. Making a difference, as I'm still trying to learn, is about being as much as it is about doing. We were very privileged last week to hear a plenary at the Amy Medical Education Conference by Dr. Ayelet Cooper from the University of Toronto Wilson Centre on broadening the curriculum beyond bioscience. And I wanted to quote this because she brings together the issues of systems, relationships and critical pedagogy so well. And I'd love to let you listen to the whole talk. Um, uh, but just one quote. The power imbalances in healthcare are huge. She spoke about her experiences of that, especially for those who are marginalized. By not teaching students about critical reflection, we allow graduates to think that systems don't need changing, and that all is well in the doctor-patient relationship. And we know that both of those are certainly not true. So what are the challenges for us if we take a notion of critical pedagogy and place seriously? It has implications for health policy, for health systems, for health professions, education. Responding as a university and as a faculty I think we need to be researching, developing the notion of rural impact assessment. We need to be talking to the NHI. We need to be thinking about resource allocation in our faculty and institutional structures and how they promote uh, addressing these issues of rural health. Rural health needs to be everyone's business, not just the business of a Kwanda Centre for Rural Health. And we need to be thinking about changing education. When it comes to changing education, I think the questions that we need to be addressing are who do we select? I think we should be having a rural quota to reflect the 35% of people who are rural. But also how we select, how do we involve communities in that? How do we support those we select, enabling the transition from rural areas into urban-based training? We need to think about what the focus of our training is. What kind of graduates do we want to produce? <coughs> Thinking about what we teach students. Are graduates equipped to deal with the most common problems and to change the system? Do we equip them with resilience, not just internal but external and support in how you deal with those kind of uh, issues? We need to think about where we do training. Going beyond lift service and really taking seriously the fact that context matters. Thinking about the kinds of programs we deliver. If you heard, I've worked on other work programs, particularly around clinical associates. I'd love to do that. I know the Western Cape Department of Health doesn't love us to do that, so that's an issue, but I certainly would love to do that. But in other categories, for example, rehabilitation workers. What about generic rehabilitation professionals or mid-level workers? There are a whole lot of other things we should be thinking about and how we support our graduates. So in taking this position at Ukwanda, I want to acknowledge the past. It's been 15 years of development to reach this point and wonderful achievements, which I'll highlight a few of in a moment, and appreciate the present. I work with a wonderful team, and it's been very exciting uh, to work with them and, and to plan things together. And thank you to all of them who are here tonight supporting me. But also to anticipate the future and say, where are we growing to? So some of our achievements, and I'm not going to spend long um, on this, development of the rural clinical school, placement of final year medicine, OT and dietetic students for a year in a rural area, the first program like that in Africa and in terms of OT probably the world, the establishment of a longitudinal clinical training integrated, first one in, in Africa, working with stakeholders, I work with the hospital, etc. Uh, etc. But where we go from here, we want to expand, extend and deepen undergraduate rural training in all programs in the faculty. Growing the rural clinical school but establishing new rural clinical schools. And we're excited about developments in the Northern Cape where we're moving into Uppington, which uh, is part of that. We want to make a difference to rural communities by working on the whole pipeline and selecting and training a cohort of rural students. We want to grow our collaborative care and work together with communities to achieve better integration, working equitably with all programs. We want to engage with other faculties, involve them in Aquanda and the Rural Clinical School, and explore multidisciplinary 
Institute. We want to develop a research hub that will drive rural health research aimed at addressing equity with a focus in four areas, rural health professions education, collaborative care, first thousand days and applied clinical research. And we want to become a resource for other faculties in South Africa and beyond. So that is our dream. Our dream, a place in the sun for rural people and rural health care. We will know that dream has been realized when rural women giving birth are no longer more likely to die. When rural children under fire are no longer less likely to live, survive and flourish. When rural mothers no longer have to carry their children long distances on their backs to access care. When all policies at any level are reviewed in terms of their rural impact and include targeted strategies to address rural communities. When selected students are based in rural areas for their entire health professional training, doing electives in the city on occasion. When rural learners have equitable access to health professions training. When there are sufficient posts, sorry, when there are sufficient posts for the right kind of health professionals in rural areas and graduates are competing with each other in order to be selected into those posts, then we will know we have reached our dream. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Thank you for your attention.